Major funding for this program is made possible by grants from Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Inc., New York's Window Company, New York Community Bank, Capital One Bank, Greenberg Traurig, LLP. Additional funding is provided by grants from Akron Gold Brothers, LLC, Briarwood Organization, Beechwood Organization, C.B. Richard Ellis, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Friedman, LLP, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, M&T Bank, Must Development, LLC, Des Moines Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Orphanides and Associates, SJP Properties, Sterling and Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, Urban American, W Financial Mortgage Fund, the Wickoff Group. Hello, my name is Michael Stoller. The big title, everything that's happening today is Stuyvesant Town, Peter Cooper Village. What's happening? Who knows what's going to happen? Uh, we're not here to discuss what happened in the past. We're here today to discuss what's going to happen in the future. But I don't have my crystal ball, so I've asked these four very intelligent individuals to provide their insight in what's going to happen with Stuyvesant Town, Peter Cooper Village. Um, my guests include Jim Kuhn, the president of Newmark Knight Frank, Dan Gorodnik, uh, councilman of the city of New York and a resident of Stuy Town, Stephen Whitkoff, the president of the Whitkoff organization, and last but definitely not least, uh, a regular over here, uh, Joseph Ficalora, the chairman, president, and CEO of New York Community Bank Corp. Joe, you have one of the largest loans where, where a bank has the loan on any property in New York City and probably in the country in Co-op Village. What do you see happening? I mean, I'm not here to say that Tishman Spire made an error, which they probably did, and, you know, every, because everybody wanted. It was a time that over there. What do you see as a banker? What do you see as a, as a real estate leader and as somebody who's been involved with the Fed and everything else? Well, well, well Co-op City is not Stuyvesant Town. Co-op City is a co-op. The people there own the property. I agree. The New York Community Bank is a leader in affordable multifamily sure. rent-regulated apartments. So where do you see this? I mean, Stuytown is where Jimmy grew up. Jimmy's father and mother lived there. They were there 60 years. Dan's been there his entire lifetime. Uh, Steve probably wanted to buy it over the period of time. And you, you've probably been offered the financing on it. So where do you see what's going to happen? Well, some of that's up in the air right now. Obviously, there will be others who could talk about structures that might work. I think the, the important thing to recognize, though, is that right now the most money that is at risk in Stuytown is, in fact, taxpayer money. Because Fannie and Freddie happen to, in fact, be bankrupt. And the only money available to cover their losses are taxpayer dollars. So uh, th there is always a, a winner and a loser in anything. In this particular case, the uh, outstanding debt, to the largest degree, is held by the taxpayer. So whatever happens you know, here. With regard to that, and maybe someone else would even chime in with your, does Fannie and Freddie, which happens to be us, the, the, sure. the, the, the taxpayers and the government, do they stay in later on if the property is converted to a cooperative? Do they well, remain? They, cer they certainly can. Would right. they? Well, I mean, what? what I well, don't know. Michael, I think you need to take a step back for a second, though. Because um, you asked the question, what's going to happen? I don't think any of us know what's going to happen. Right. I think we all have our opinions on what should happen. If you remember, uh, some years ago, we converted to uh, Lincoln Towers. Which I think is important. It, Try to explain to yeah. my audience. We, we bought the MacArthur Foundation portfolio, and Lincoln Towers was a big part of it. I think it was 4,000 units. And at the time, the tenants were very 
well organized because they expected it. They had no buy pledges signed. And we negotiated a deal with them where, in fact, it was a non-evict plan so that if you didn't buy the apartments, you were not forced to move out. You were still a rent protected, rent stabilized tenant. And we actually um, ended up selling 65% of the apartments. And I think that everybody has to understand today is you have a lot of emotion involved in what's going to be potentially a negotiation but didn't you on have price. A, didn't you have a, a motion at that time because Lincoln Towers was such a large yes, unit? Yes, it's the I same. Mean, it was, a, I mean, it was 4,000 units. It's, 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 it's almost identical. It's, a, it's almost an identical situation at a different time. The point being that a negotiation with a tenants association that has somewhat control um, is usually turns out to be a fair negotiation where the tenants end up with apartments uh, well below the, what they could buy in the marketplace um, and the landlord ends up with less than he would like but hopefully enough to make a profit and cover the debt. My question is who's the landlord now? I mean Marty Raines was the landlord when he bought the property. Today we have the a, landlord. Today we have, we have somebody who's holding the keys. Well, you know, we, we don't know who the landlord really is. Ultimately, Fishman gave back the keys. Right, but ultimately, in terms of legality today, you'd have to say the landlord is going to be um, CW Capital, who was the special servicer for the debt group. Agreed, um, but the special the, servicer the, doesn't care. You know, they're no, getting fees. They, they no, they that's don't that's have, not true, Michael. First of all, the special servicer ha has the B piece of the loan. They have a fiduciary obligation to the to the uh, group. They do care, and I I think they, CW they, is a very they, responsible they, they, special service. They, they care to a point, but you know, someone who owns it, a, a private operator, has a different care than CW. But they're not going to own it forever. I agree. So my question is, you live there, uh, you know, you live there. You're a tenant. Uh, you're probably a rent stabilized tenant. Now I'm a rent stabilized tenant. You after. weren't. I was not, uh, but I became one after the Court of Appeals Wait a ruled second. against. How could, you've been there for so many years. How had you? Well, uh, I grew up in a rent stabilized apartment, and then I went off to uh, college, law school, and all the rest. When I returned to Peter Cooper Village, I moved into what was then a market rate apartment. When did you? When did you move back? 2004. Uh, and for the subsequent years, I was a market rate tenant until the Court of Appeals ruled in favor of tenants uh, this past October, saying that all of those market rate apartments were brought to the market illegally by Tishman Spire and MetLife. So today, I am a rent stabilized tenant, and, and all of and those and tenants are rent stabilized. how much has your rent gone down with the adjustment? It hasn't been a significant amount, I can tell you that much. In fact, for a lot of people, the rents uh, stayed the same. Uh, it was for a small percentage in which there was really any decrease at all. But the point of all of that was that all of this business strategy, the entire plan that was uh, set forth in 2006, was based on the idea you could turn the apartments to the market as quickly as possible. Not only did we learn that that was not achievable, but it was also illegal. So to answer your question, though, going forward, how do you make sure who's going to be making the decisions here? Well, I think that you, you need to bring in a new owner. The new owner could be uh, the Tenants Association. It could be the Tenants Association partnered with a sponsor who wants to do the right things by that group in order to ensure the long-term affordability of that community. It's a symbol for middle-class people uh, around the city. It's a symbol uh, in New York City. Uh, to make sure that there's adequate maintenance and that you protect the historic configuration of that property. There's a real opportunity today to make something positive out, as w out of what is a very difficult and complicated situation. You know, at the time Stytown was built, MetLife in the, in the New York area did three projects. They did Stytown, they did Parkchester in the Bronx, and they did Rivington in Harlem. Uh, now, the keys are being given back on Rivington because too much financing on that property. Parkchester. What happened in Parkchester? Harry Helmsley bought it and did a conversion with the tenants. To mm -hmm. the tenants. It's not a co-op. Condominium. So you're you're saying so that's the private person, the private developer making a deal. The only difference here is that I believe that in order to get something done in a reasonable amount of time, if you cut out the middleman, everybody has more to gain. So who, my, who's, my the, who's the middleman? The middleman is if you bring in a developer who needs to earn a profit. So in this particular situation, I, I sort of feel like we're past the point where if you want to make a deal where the lenders will come out whole, and I do believe the senior lenders can come out whole, 
and the tenants get a good deal together, um, I think that's the negotiation that needs to happen. Now I'm going to ask the developer. You looked at this and you were going to be part of the development group when you lost the bid. You were lucky you didn't win the bid in 2006. You were part of that deal. Would you be the developer today? Why would you want to get into this hot potato, as one might say? I think that uh, this deal transaction requires what Dan, the type of developer Dan was talking about, somebody who is going to be involved, first of all, who is very substantial. Well, I'm not at that level. And somebody who has very altruistic motives with regard to this deal for all the reasons Dan talked about. Because I think that, I, I happen to agree, I think that this is going to be a tenant-oriented deal. That's how you're going to get Fann Fannie and Freddie in line here. Um, and, uh, Joe, Joe. you know, the property has an appraised value, Mike, below the senior debt. So at the end of the day, everybody over Fannie and Freddie's level doesn't matter. You know, CW, in my opinion, is, is, uh, is, is not going to have a lot to say you know, mean, in, the, in, in time. All of the tranches and all the mez debt and the other equity has been wiped out. Most people have said that it's been wiped out. Where do you see this, Joe? Do you see a private developer or do you see a tenants association well, getting I think involved the, I with think this? there's far more rationale for a tenants association to come in. But in this unique circumstance, the taxpayer is the biggest loser. So without looking back too far, we just need to look at the transfer of wealth here is from the hands of the people that invested in the deal, which you missed, but is now going to be to who? Why do you assume the taxpayer is losing money? Because um, Fannie and Freddie are in the senior position. So why are you assuming they're not going to come out whole? Well, the, the question is, depending on the structure, how will they be paid? And how much of what they've invested will they be paid? So if, let's say, they are 2 or $3 billion, of what has already been identified as loss. In other words, no one is going to get paid $5.4 billion. And they will, in fact, lose a, the largest share of whatever is to be lost. So the question then becomes, will they, in fact, have the largest share of whatever is to be made? Now, if, if in fact, it goes to tenants, and tenants buy in and have all the rights of ownership and then have the right of disposition at a gain, are the taxpayers taking the loss and the tenants taking the gain? Well, I think the key here is to find a, an elegant solution that protects the interests of Fannie, Freddie, the senior debt here, yeah. uh, and one that also uh, recognizes and supports the interest of the 25,000 people who live there at the same time. You know, we realize that uh, taxpayers have bailed out Fannie and Freddie now to the tune of a, a hundred four billion dollars. I think the cap is up to 400 billion or more. Or more. Uh, and there are implications for us as taxpayers on both sides. Right. Uh, and so the key here is going to be finding a solution. We really want Fannie and Freddie to be active participants here because we believe that their charter mandates that they come and support tenant action like what we are trying to achieve here. And when they do, I think that there will be a solution that will, uh, you know, make them whole and also protect the interests of the tenants. I just want to go tenants. back and make one random point because I think it's important for all our listeners who are not sophisticated in the real estate industry. Because you made a comment that, this, this, that the uh, court ruled that he raised rents illegally. I just think we need to define that it wasn't a landlord capriciously raising right. rents illegally. It was a system that was being monitored by HPD and DHCR, right. right. where every landlord in New York believed, in accordance with two government bodies, they were doing the right. correct thing. Right. And it's unfortunate what happened, who's to say right or wrong, but it wasn't the case of somebody illegally gouging right. rents. And that's, that's important to go not, that's, on the record. That's, that's, that's right. I think that's an nor, extremely nor the, important nor, point. nor, Jimmy, does it really affect the economics. What affected the economics is the market. Because the fact is that all that happened is you got to bring an apartment to, you still get to bring the apartment to its maximum rental number that you can get in the marketplace today. It's just controlled and, and stabilized now, from now, that now point I have forward. A, I have a question. Let's say the, the tenants with a private developer or someone takes over the property. Um, we had a question before, uh, prior to the show. Can a tenant in Lincoln Towers, a tenant bought a unit, and if they sold the unit, profit, whatever profit. Uh, in New York City, under certain affordable new hop programs and some of the programs where, you know, they, the, the land was given away for a dollar or other programs, the tenants who bought an affordable cooperative 
uh, where there's an underlying, they have a certain amount of money they, they, they can make. Where do, we, where do we see this in Stuytown? Is it a tenant who's been there for a long time? Do they get the opportunity, or are they capped on how much they should I earn? I think we have a really big difference of opinion here. Um, That's you know, why I asked the question. R right now, you could make the assumption this is a private deal going to be made, and the tenants are going to make what they're allowed to make. It really depends, in the end, on what the federal government has to do different than a private deal. If it was a simple private deal, the tenants should be able to make whatever they could make. We're in America. But, it, but you have the federal government right. on the loan. Right. So since it's that way, you know, in, in a way, it's like you, when you bought Amtrust, you took over. No, I mean, the government has an interest in the profitability. So why shouldn't the government have a, a profitability interest if a tenant sells a unit? Well, I think there's no, no question here. The difference is that the United States government is already in this game, far more so economically than any of the tenants. The tenants have lived there for decades under very favorable terms. So the opportunity to have more favorable terms in making an investment is not necessarily consistent with the idea that they've already had favorable terms to live there for the last two decades or three decades or whatever. But, but I, I think the point that I want to make is immediately there is no question that the largest loser in what has happened here, the default on the property, is not Tishman, it's not the, the people that were the owners, it was the people that were the lenders. And the largest lender... I mean, all of the lenders right. we're talking. But, but the, the largest the lender is the United States government, and the largest lender has already gone defunct, and the government on Christmas Eve said, we the people will stand behind on an unlimited basis. They didn't say we will cover 400 billion. You talk about TARP and you talk about all the other ways in which the government's obligating. They said we will stand by Fannie and Freddie on an unlimited basis, which means that all the losses which inherently are in their portfolios are the losses of the taxpayer. They so, don't make money. So Joe, why wouldn't you treat this similar to uh, Goldman Sachs or any of the other recipients? Why couldn't the federal government get warrants so that the uh, apartment house people could sell, the tenants could sell for I profit. That's what I brought up and, before. And, they, and the government would have a warrant for a piece of the upside. That makes sense. But leaving them out is the problem. Making sure that they're in, because, because the tenants have obviously an interest, but now so do the taxpayers. Right. And, and the taxpayers but, never took any but, benefit but, from but this. Joe, but, the, but that presumes that there are other buyers out there who are going to offer the federal government, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mae. Let's assume, by the way, the property has a value at its appraised right. number today of a billion eight. Right. With Fannie and Freddie debt of $2.1 billion. I happen to think that debt's dollar good, forgetting about appraisals, Dan, for a second. But a smart tenants association becomes the most viable bidder. I, I, I just don't believe that private developers are going to are going to are going to look to buy Steve who's going to pay the, the shortfall right now when there's the rents are not sufficient M but M Mike let me just finish the, the analysis if I was buying let's just assume that Fannie and Freddie would sell me their 2.1 billion dollars assuming I had that kind of money which I don't I go to Joe Ficalora and he'd say to me what's the net income and based on that net income I'll tell you what I'm going to finance here mm -hmm. I, you'd, someone would probably have to write a check north of a billion dollars correct I, don't I know think any that's private, a very good idea. I don't yeah. know any private developer on the planet who's ever done something like that. So, mm -hmm. so that's a non There's a few out there that could, so, so Okay, I'm not saying there aren't. So, so now how, like how do the mm. tenants configure a deal? Well, and this is what we talked about before. To the extent you have a very coalesced tenants association and you can bring a large mass to buy, that's an immediate pay down. Now, maybe you do it in concert with a very well-heeled developer who writes another big check right alongside of them, and that becomes the most compelling deal to Fannie, Fannie and Freddie. You know, if you were Fannie and Freddie here with that $2.1 billion mortgage, you'd sit there at your committee and you'd say, wow, that's the most compelling deal out there. I get the fastest amortization payment, and that's the most likely, and that's the most likely way that, that I'm going to get paid down in the quickest fashion. But you, you want to talk about the maintenance payments, because... What, what you really have to do is, is, is to make the government a partner and help the tenants, I believe, is that you need to get the Fannie and Freddie mortgages to be reduced to a number. And I'm not going to negotiate for, the, for either side, but right. if, you, if, if they reduce it to, say, 4%, and now you have $120 million on 130, uh, with 130 of income, and they get warrants in return, 
so that, that when the tenants sell their apartment and make this big profit, a piece of that's going to go back to pay down the debt. And that way, the government is a partner with the tenants, and, and you don't need a landlord who, who, unless he's totally altruistic, is going to need to take that piece. But you, need, you need a landlord for one thing, though. Yeah. You need a landlord to stick the $500 million of deferred maintenance into this deal to make it right, to get it sellable. However, right, maybe you don't need a landlord for that. Maybe you go to Fannie and Freddie. I'll and put Dan, more money in? At, no, oh, no. Oh, we've, all, on, we've already lost money. Let's put I more mean, money. Just simple math. And Dan, w what if Dan could deliver 50% of the tenants buying day one? At Pick a number, $400 a square foot. You probably have, what, seven, 800000 um, right, eleven thousand apartments. Eleven thousand two hundred apartments. Yeah, at at, at, at six hundred on, on average, right. So at four hundred dollars a square foot, you'd have a billion four pay down. Well, it's one, if it's, you were a lender, if you were Joe Ficalora and you were the lender here, he might say, you know what, in the face of that kind of payment, I might advance a new fresh five hundred million dollars to fix this wait, property wait a up. Let's ask him, right? No, but <laughs> I mean, <laughs> oh, I mean, I mean, you, no, but you, I mean, Joe, you're assuming <laughs> what the lender. Let's ask him. But he's not the lender. I'm just saying, in theory, oh. in theory, right? That that's how lenders might respond. But I think now you become the partner in effect. Why it is so attractive to work on a deal with the tenants here because they have the opportunity to infuse immediate capital into this transaction mm -hmm. a way that you need it. Uh, and wait, wait, where are they going to infuse? They're going to buy. Well, they're going to buy their apartments. If they have the opportunity to buy apartments, uh, and provided that it is done in a way which both gives them an opportunity to build equity in their own homes and also allows protection for Fannie and Freddie and those who need to be protected and, and, in this and, transaction, and, and Dan, you have a home run. You, you know what's going to yeah. be interesting? Many of the units will be financed by Fannie and Freddie because they'll get the 3.5% <laughs> approval. You're correct? making the assumption that you have to put $500 conceivable? million dollars yeah. into this property and you don't. Because when we did Lincoln Towers, it gave the tenants the opportunity to buy finished or unfinished apartments dependent on a price. And so all of a sudden, when the tenants become homeowners instead of renters, you would be surprised whether they would rather buy for a cheaper price without the apartment being fixed up. Now, we're talking also, though, Jimmy, about capital work, too. There's real capital work that has well, to be done. Well, that's why you there. have a reserve fund in any co-op conversion. Right. But Out of the proceeds of the sale, you're going to reserve five, six percent of the capital for a reserve fund because any good co-op association is going to make sure they have a strong reserve fund when they negotiate their plan after the Attorney General comes back with the comments. As tenant, what, what is the Tenants Association, what's their thought today? Well, I think, first of all, it's a very well-organized group. Uh, when we were participants uh, in 2006, there were about 75 percent of the tenants who signed no-buy agreements committing themselves to the Tenants Association. There is only one Tenants Association. Uh, there are thousands of members. Uh, they want to maximize the number of options that tenants have. They want to, for certain, keep uh, rent-stabilized tenants protected and not create pressures on them to move out of their apartments, particularly if they are perfectly legal and legitimate as uh, most, if not all, are today. Um, and they want to give people an opportunity, uh, if it works here, to buy their apartments uh, at a reasonable rate so that they can live there in peace and actually build some equity uh, and find a way to uh, finesse the situation here so you don't have a change in ownership every three to five years, so that you don't have uh, a for-profit entity that is coming in trying to extract people out of their apartments. We've played that game already. We've been through that already. We don't want that anymore. And so the goals here are stability, affordability, uh, and uh, protecting the maintenance on the property. Joe? Well, th that sounds extraordinarily reasonable. And if there were not massive losses being taken in front of this conversation, there would be no more, more to discuss. So had that been Mitchell Lahmer and it was being turned over by the state to the co-op owners, such as Co-op City, Co-op City, the tenants, the co-op owners, own the entire complex. So we, in fact, provided a $480 million loan for that property to be improved for the benefit of the owners, the co-op owners. In this circumstance, however, we don't have co-op owners. You're talking about the possibility of creating co-op owners. But if we do that without recognition of who, in fact, is taking the big loss, which right now is the taxpayer, then we're, we're leaving out an important component of how you've come to where you are. So, and this has nothing to do with the lawsuit. This has to do with what is the right 
redistribution of, of wealth, if you will. The economics in, in this particular complex have existed for decades. The long-term holder of this asset was MetLife. They ran the property well, as best as I know. Mm -hmm. They ran the property well to the benefit of all the tenants, and they were there for many decades. They were offered to sell at a very, very high price. And they sold only and because they be went public. MetLife really subsidized this for many, many years. They over made, they, they spent much more money than they had to. Right. And they kept the property. Correct. That's right. They were a they great They had to owner. exercise their right to sell it. That's right. And, and, they, they, had and they made a very big profit they had the right, in selling. They had the right. And, and, and the point that you made earlier, MetLife did not break the law. Neither did Tishman break the law. Unfortunately, the amicus brief that was filed by the city agency responsible for changing the rent in that complex was ignored. So the, the well, amicus no, no, brief... I, mean, I, I, just, I have to correct a couple of things. First of all, um, there was some conflicting authority coming out of DHCR as to what was proper and what was right. Um, that should have been a flag, I think, for anybody involved here as to what was legal, what was not legal. As it turns out, the Court of Appeals said that you can't do it. Uh, it did not rule on retroactivity and other matters, but the question here is not was it legal. As it turns out, it was not legal. Uh, I just want to ask one last question. Do you, do, does the group believe that a private developer will get involved with the Tenants Association in this transaction? I believe they will because I believe that as a special servicer, um, they, they're going to feel that their fiduciary obligation is to get people who know how to run property in there fast. But you can get a property manager. There's well, that's what they're going to do. They're going to get uh, a property a pro manager. Okay, a property. I'm, not to, I'm saying, will the end product be a, uh, an owner, a, 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 an investor, and the Tenants Association? No, I think it'll just be the Tenants Association. Joe? I'm not sure. I know that, that the Wilbur Ross Group and, and LEFRAC are real players, and, and they conceivably could be relevant in this decision process? Stevie? Uh, I think it's not a player like that, my own opinion. Those are guys who need to make a lot of money on because they're running pr pr funds. public funds. No, I think if Dan does a good job here, he's got the most leverage. I think and that Dan, that paper is dollar the, good. The, t the only person who's a tenant <laughs> sitting with us? I, I would say that every interested party out there will do their best to wrap their arms around the Tenants Association. Uh, and the tenant body, and we're going to do our best to ensure that there's an outcome that actually respects the goals that the tenants have and, set and, out. And what we're going to do, and I'm going to ask all four of you to remember, because in, in a couple of months, I'm going to ask the group to come back where we can see what has happened and what's going to happen in the future. So I'd like to thank Jim Kuhn, Dan Gorodnik, <laughs> Steve Whitkoff, <laughs> Joe Ficalora. Next week, we're going to be talking about affordable housing. Okay. See you next week. Major funding for this program is made possible by grants from Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Inc., New York's Window Company, New York Community Bank, Capital One Bank, Greenberg Traurig, LLP. Additional funding is provided by grants from Akron Gold Brothers, LLC, Briarwood Organization, Beechwood Organization, C.B. Richard Ellis, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Friedman, LLP, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, M&T Bank, Must Development, LLC, Des Moines Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Orphanides and Associates, SJP Properties, Sterling and Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, Urban American, W Financial Mortgage Fund, The Wickoff Group.